While the first mention of Ukraine getting the GLSDB was back in November, the ground launch small diameter bomb munition finally got confirmed by the US at the start of February. It will get delivered to Ukraine's military to be launched from the existing HIMARS and MLRS launchers. Those are becoming more and more numerous in Ukraine, with 15 MLRS launchers pledged by UK, Germany, Italy and France, on top of 20 HIMARS delivered by the US. There are 18 more HIMARS pledged by the US, but those are to be made from scratch and delivered in a few years, according to the US. The launchers delivered have the combined capacity to hold some 300 rockets. Right now they hold the GMLRS or Gimler's missiles, which are precise, fast and deadly. But before the end of this year, those will be joined by another munition option. Gimler's is a family of guided missiles the US has sent to Ukraine to be used from launchers such as the HIMARS. The GLSDB, which made the small diameter bomb with the rocket motor from the M26 MLRS rocket. The M26 was often the rocket of choice for MLRS back in the 1980s and 1990s before guided Gimler's rounds became available. It's not used in Ukraine due to its old age and banned cluster warhead. Anyway, the weapon makers took the bottom half of the rocket, with the rocket motor, and mated it to the SDB, the small diameter bomb, which is a smart bomb to be dropped from planes. It entered service in 2006 and is still in production. The bomb can be deployed from jets flying past Mach 1 if needed. It relies on GPS signals to achieve almost pinpoint precision, with possible errors of just a few feet. But the biggest reason why it makes sense to mate it with a rocket booster is the fact the bomb unfolds its wings and glides towards a target. It benefits from something cheap and simple to get it high up, as if it was launched from a plane. While gliding, it can achieve a much greater range than a simple rocket, fired from the ground. Here are a few comparisons. The M26 rocket has a much shorter reach than the M31 Gimlers, for example. SDB range shown is likely applicable to high subsonic, high altitude launches. Some launches were also done by F-22s, which achieved longer ranges, though the military did not disclose the figures. Then there's the ground-launched SDB, whose range may be in fact similar to a launch from a plane flying at Mach 1.5 or less. There are other differences, of course. Gimler's rounds come in two variations. M30 is designed to detonate above ground and disperse many lethal fragments. While not good against protected targets, it can be more lethal against infantry in the open or unarmored vehicles and equipment. M31 has a unitary explosive warhead, which has 50% more explosive filler than the SDB. So out in the open, it packs a stronger punch but SDB was designed to penetrate up to one meter of reinforced concrete under a meter of earth. In fact, its total warhead weight with the penetrating steel cap is even slightly greater than the warhead weight of the M31 with its warhead, which is a blast fragmentation one, not really tailored for penetration. So it's possible SDBs will be used for attacking various targets more hardened than what M31 would be used on like large bunkers or even to penetrate deeper inside multi-story buildings. Gimler's rounds can't really do that as efficiently. As a quick comparison, here's also the weight of an average 155mm artillery round. Both HIMARS launch systems pack a bigger punch. The big benefit of the new weapon compared to Gimler's is definitely reach. 60 kilometers more means many more targets can be added including the entire Donbas region and even reaching northern Crimea. Importantly, the entire south of Zaporozhia and Donetsk regions will be reachable while keeping the launcher vehicles far away from the front line. That's something that was not always doable with Gimlers, as the HIMARS launchers would be under too much of a threat if used near the front lines. The effect of that would be that Russia's main supply lines to Kherson and Crimea regions would be under at least some threat. Strikes into Russia are possible, but those don't seem to have been done with Gimler's either, as the US doesn't approve that. So it's less likely anything will change with GLSDB either. But range is not everything. The new weapon can also glide alongside predetermined waypoints. Its manufacturer showed, for example, 
routes towards a target which go around the mountain and then strike the target from behind. The weapon can also strike targets 70 kilometers behind its launch point. Of course, it's evident that the more the bomb maneuvers in flight, the less actual range to target it will have. But nevertheless, being able to attack targets from less expected directions can be quite important. For example, Russians in Crimea might have thought they are safe from missiles coming over the Azov Sea. But in the future, they will have to be monitoring those approaches as well. When a single target is saturated with several missiles, the defenses have an easier time defending against just one quadrant. If multiple threats are coming from different directions at the same time, defending from those becomes harder. The SDB, however, has one thing going against it, compared to the Gimler's rounds. Enemy air defenses can more easily track it and engage it, possibly shooting it down in greater numbers than with the Gimler's. That's because the SDB is a winged bomb. When it deploys its wings, which provide its long reach and maneuverability, it's also shedding a lot of speed compared to a fairly streamlined missile. The whole bomb with its wing deployment mechanism also means the shape is fairly complex and gives out a greater radar reflection than the fairly simple missile shape of the Gimlers. Greater radar reflection means enemy air defenses will spot the SDB earlier, which will give them more time to react and engage. Also, as the SDB is slower while it glides towards the target, that will give the defenses some extra time to react. Figures shown are for the M26 rocket, whose motor the GLSDB uses as a booster. While M31 rocket figures aren't known, we can use the initial 70 km reach variant of the Russian Smirch rocket for a rough approximation. Due to smaller density and the forward steering fins that the Gimlers uses, it's likely the US missile flies a flatter trajectory, where air density is greater. So its apogee speed is slower, but it still likely impacts at around 500 meters per second or so. The SDB, even though it's somewhat supersonic at the moment when it detaches from the M26 rocket booster, definitely drops below Mach 1 as it deploys its wings and glides to achieve great range. In that gliding portion of its flight, which is likely done at altitudes of 12 to 5 kilometers, it may drop to speeds comparable to those of cruise missiles, or some Mach 0.6 to Mach 0.7. That would amount to roughly 200 meters per second. The weight of the GLSDB is likely quite close to the M26 weight. As the bomb gets closer to the target, it may start diving and picking up more speed, but it will still not go supersonic again. For example, the heavy, dense guided bomb Fritz X still impacted at 290 meters per second, which is Mach 0.85. So the Gimlers is likely roughly two times faster than both its cruise flight stage and its terminal attack stage. While Russia has been using air defenses to shoot down some Gimlers missiles as well to mixed results, it will likely have an easier time with the SDB. That does not mean the SDB is pointless. Even if two or three times more SDBs are shot down, some will still go through. But most importantly, the greater area under threat will force Russia to utilize an even greater number of air defense assets to protect all those targets in the back. Perhaps even forcing Russia to disperse their air defense assets near the front line as well, if their total numbers show to be lacking. So how many SDBs might Ukraine get? And when? Well, the latter part was answered by the US State Department. SDBs should start arriving within 9 months. So let's say at the end of November. From the wording used, it seems the US will be procuring newly made SDBs for Ukraine. So 9 months fits that timetable, requiring as much to make a new bomb. Modifications are required to the SDB to be used from the adapter joint, which connects it to the M26's rocket motor. The latter is in theory very plentiful, but there are issues there as well. Some half a million M26 rockets were made from 1980 to 2001 for the US military. Some were expended and in 2007 the US started to destroy and recycle old rockets. In 2009 the inventory stood at 364,000. And knowing that 99,000 were destroyed from 2007 to 2012 alone, it's likely the US had around 300,000 left in 2012 and 200,000 left in 2017, 
when the recycling orders ended. Lifetime of the M26 rocket motor is between 18 and 25 years, depending on sources. So they're either expired or nearing expiration date. Of course, the expiration date doesn't mean the rocket motor can't be used. But it does mean it can be unreliable. It can fizzle. It can burn out incorrectly and crash the missile in flight. It's likely the least all the rockets are being examined with X-ray machines and their rocket fuel is being assessed. That and making the SDB adapters is also a time-consuming process, so the 9-month figure likely rings true due to that as well. It's likely M26 booster rockets will not be the bottleneck though, as a good part of the 200,000 will likely still be good enough to be used. As for the SDBs, well, their current production numbers aren't high. Just under 1,000 were budgeted for US procurement in 2022. Before that, they were produced in bigger numbers, with some 41,000 produced since 2005, of which likely several thousand were used up. But as said, the US is not planning to send ones from their military stocks. US media have been quoting US officials stating that no more than $200 million would be allocated for Ukraine's SDBs initially. SDB production will likely increase now, encompassing both bombs for the US, export and for Ukraine. Due to greater quantities procured, its price per unit may drop from the 2022 high. 200 million adjusted for recent prices gives between 2400 and 5000 bombs. Though due to complexity, the added M26 integration costs, it's likely the lower figure will be closer to actual figure for bombs shipped to Ukraine in the first year or so. So Ukraine is likely to get a few hundred GLSDBs by the end of 2023, and likely over 2000 more during 2024. Or even a bit more depending on production ramp up and subsequent contracts. The bomb will not be a game changer in itself and Ukraine still stands to profit more if the Allies ever give it the even longer range ATAC-MS or various cruise missiles, but the GLSDB will be another potent weapon that will force Russia to watch their rear even more, forcing them to dilute their resources on securing their depots and other important facilities, or relocating them further away, which would lower their efficiency. That's it for this video. If you like our stuff, do consider becoming a member of our channel or our patron. Links for that are in video description. We've also got a cool video under prep, where a modern day Japanese destroyer time travels to 1942 to fight in the Battle of Midway. Something different from the harsh reality, right?